Hello, welcome to the second talk of today's colloquium. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Hannah Sande from University of California at Berkeley. Uh, she is uh, an assistant professor of linguistics there and uh, Hannah uh, carry out, carries out uh, both documentary and theoretical linguistic research. Uh, and also her work uh, uh, <clears throat> investigates uh, the interaction of phonology with morphology and syntax and uh, looking at uh, mainly African languages. She has worked in West Africa uh, with speakers of uh, Gebie. Uh, it's a crew language uh, and undocumented language uh, spoken in Cote d'Ivoire. She also works with uh, various other languages or has worked with various uh, other languages, uh, speakers of various other languages, such as Amharic, Dafing, Nobin, and Nushi. Uh, spoken in various parts of Africa. And it's uh, good to, and she's a main organizer, active organizer of the uh, Berkeley Phonology <laughs> Group. And uh, uh, she has been, uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> uh, very good in uh, sending all this information and sharing. So if you're interested in, please check that out as well. Yeah. So uh, it's good to have you here, Hannah. And today uh, she will talk about co phonologies by face phases as the domain of phonological evaluation. Thank you very much for that. Um, let me know if at any point you can't uh, see my screen or um, hear me. So I'm going to um, be talking about cophonologies by phase. This talk will kind of be an introduction to the framework of cophonologies by phase, um, but I'm going to focus on one specific aspect of this framework, which is um, phases as the domain of phonological evaluation. So one big question here. Oh, there's something funny going on with my screen sharing. Let's see. Maybe it fixed itself. OK, um, so one big question here is what is the domain of phonological evaluation? We often think of when we're applying phonology, um, we think of um, constraints sort of evaluating a single word at a time or maybe a, a particular prosodic domain. Um, and I'm going to ask here, what really is the domain of phonological evaluation? Um, so some phonological alternations seem to affect subword domains. Um, so in, for example, in Ojibwe, Newell and Piggott, um, have shown that vowel hiatus resolution, um, how, how vowel hiatus is resolved is sensitive to certain boundaries within words. So um, in this first example, the underlying form has vowels um, that are sequential at a morpheme boundary and in the surface form, only one of those vowel surfaces. So we get deletion to resolve this potential vowel hiatus. Um, but at a different word internal boundary, you also get underlyingly this um, vowel vowel sequence um, and it surfaces faithfully. So at two different word internal boundaries, you get two different um, two different strategies for resolving or not resolving vowel hiatus. And um, what Newell and Pickett have, have said is that this difference is due to um, syntactic phase boundaries. So namely that the Noun plural boundary in 1A is within a syntactic phase domain. And the um, sort of what we would think of as a kind of uh, ad positional meaning, the sort of preverb on the, or this prefix on the noun, um, there's a phase boundary in between those two things. And that's why we don't get hiatus resolution resolved. And then in other cases, we have. Um, phonological alternations that can cross word boundaries. So in Korea, which is a Bantu language, um, in different tense aspect contexts, so there's tense aspect prefixes on verbs, and in different tense aspect contexts, a high tone is assigned to a different mora in the verb stem. The verb stem is in brackets here. Um, so in the inceptive tense aspect where you have this raw prefix, a high tone is assigned to the fourth mora of the verb stem and then spreads to the penultimate more of the domain. Um, and the spreading is a completely regular process across the language, but the high tone assignment to the fourth mora is specific to this um, inceptive context. When the verb stem is short, however, um, you keep counting. So um, when the verb stem only has two moras, you keep counting. Um, the fourth mora is then the second mora of the object, in this case, banana, um, and the high tone is assigned there and spreads to the penultimate mora of the domain, um, 
where that domain must be larger than a word boundary because we're getting um, high tone assignment, not just within the verbal word, but also the object. Um, in different tense aspect contexts, you get the high tone assigned to different moras of the domain. Um, so when we have reassured, um, the high tone starts on the first mora of the verb stem, not the fourth as in the inceptive. Um, so in this case, we're seeing a morpheme specific process, namely where the high tone is assigned um, that can cross word boundaries. So um, subword and or word level and um, phrase bounded or crossword phonology is often modeled using different tools or frameworks. Um, and I think there are two reasons for this. So I and I think that both of them are um, myths. So I think there are two myths specifically about differences between word or subword processes and phrasal or crossword processes. And the first one is that long distance crossword phonology is always prosodic in nature, um, involving tone or vowel length. Um, while on the other hand, word or subword phonology is not necessarily prosodic, but can involve segmental things like the vowel hiatus resolution we saw in Ojibwe. Um, the second one is that phrase level phonology is non-exceptional in this if you're familiar with lexical phonology, um, this is similar to ideas of say post-lexical um, phonology where you have a sort of general phonological grammar that applies once all of your words are present and have been um, evaluated at the word level separately. So phrase level phonology is expected to be non-exceptional, uh, non-morpheme specific, but subword phonology can be morpheme specific. Um, and I'm gonna focus on this second point here, and I'm gonna show you that this is not true. Um, we've already seen with Coria that um, phrase level or crossword level phonology can be morpheme specific. Um, so the more specific questions that will drive this talk are can exceptional or morpheme specific phonology affect multiple words? Yes, as we've seen in Coria, but these processes are still domain bounded. Um, is there a difference in substance between word and sub subword and crossword? Um, phonology. I'm not going to focus on this too much, but I'm happy to answer questions about it in the question period. Um, basically, the short answer is no, there's not a meaningful difference in the substance. Um, segmental and super segmental uh, processes can apply at both levels. Do the domains of application of morpheme specific phonology align with syntactic domain boundaries? I'm going to say yes. Um, syntactic boundaries, namely syntactic phase boundaries, are a good um, candidate for sort of defining these phonological domains. And then how do we model this? I'm going to show you a model, um, cophonologies by phase, which builds in phases as the domain of phonological evaluation. And we're going to look at two primary case studies. There won't be time to talk about the third one, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. And it's included in the slides in case you want to take a look on your own. Um, the first case study is ATR harmony and also nasal harmony within a subword domain in Gabier, a crew language. Um, and the second case study is the Curia example that we've already seen. So crossword tone assignment in Curia. Um, the third example would involve, if I were talking about it today, um, two morphological triggers within a single domain that interact with each other. Um, so here's a quick overview of the structure of the talk, and I'll just jump right into a preview of the model. Um, so cophonologies by phase or CBP combines distributed morphology operations such as late insertion of vocabulary items with phonological evaluation via weighted constraints. And crucially, it assumes an enriched notion of vocabulary items um, or lexical representations. So if in traditional distributed morphology, our vocabulary items look like in three, um, where a morphosyntactic feature is mapped to some phonological form. Um, in traditional distributed morphology, these, can, these mappings can um, be sort of sensitive to the, the root that's present, like in this example from English, where um, a plural feature in English is mapped to no phonological content if the root in question is moose or deer, um, but it's mapped to un when the root is ox, and it's mapped to z. Otherwise, we don't have to list um, Allomorph, phonologically predictable allomorphs like um, s or us, um, which are which we can derive in the the regular phonology. Um, so traditional DM vocabulary items um, have just sort of this one phonological piece of information, which is um, an underlying phonological form. But in cophonologies by phase, each vocabulary item contains three pieces of phonological information. 
including that same underlying phonological form, um, which I'll represent with this F. Um, the other two pieces are a prosodic subcategorization frame, which I won't talk too much about here, um, but that's represented with this fancy P and a constraint weight readjustment. And this allows us to get um, morpheme specific um, phonologies or co-phonologies um, within a particular domain. So the constraint weight adjustment will add to, literally add um, some number to the default weight of that constraint for the language. So we have some default grammar that applies in most cases, but when there is a morpheme specific constraint weight adjustment R, um, then we will end up with a slightly different constraint weighting than elsewhere. And um, that will result in uh, co-phonology, a different phonology in that context. Um, Morpheme specific weights only apply during phonological evaluation of the syntactic phase that contains that triggering morpheme. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna assume that syntactic phase heads include D, voice, and C, um, though arguably the best evidence for phasehood comes from language specific and syn syntactic, um, syntactic and morphophonological diagnostics. Um, Non-crucially, I'm also going to assume that when a phase head is merged, it's spelled out together with its complement, though the case studies I'm talking about here today would work equally as well if you say that the phase head is not merged, um, not spelled out with its complement. Previous work has shown that cophonologies by phase can model a number of different types of phenomena, um, category specific phonology, crossword or um, phrasal morpheme specific phonology, subword cyclic effects, um, inside out effects, where a lower morpheme within a particular domain can trigger some alternation on a, a hierarchically higher morpheme within that same domain. And this is um, attested in across languages, but it's not um, predicted by a number of theories of morphophonology, for example, traditional cophonology theory. Um, and dub, as the, right, the final point I have here is doubly morphologically conditioned um, phonological effects. And I have a, a phonology paper about this from last year. Um, and this is related to the final case study, which I won't talk about today. But in the rest of today's talk, I'm going to focus on the fact that the phase-based phase nature um, of cophonologies by phase straightforwardly accounts for both subword and crossword phonological operations in a unified way. So let's jump into the GABA data. GABA is an endangered crew language spoken in Southwest Cote d'Ivoire. And the data presented here comes from original fieldwork with GABA um, over the past, this really should be eight plus years. Um, the crew family in general is drastically understudied, but there's lots of really fascinating grammatical patterns of interest to theoretical linguistics. So if any of you are looking for a project, crew languages um, are a great place to look. Now, this is a map of Cote d'Ivoire and these green languages down here are all crew languages. There are also crew languages spoken across the border in Liberia and Gabier is spoken right about here. This is um, Nyagbo Dunua, the largest Gabier village where this data was collected. And um, here are some photos of me collecting that data. We're collaborating with um, speakers in the community. Um, the data collected here was all done in team-based um, fieldwork with a number of my students and also with um, Ivoirian linguist Stefan Pepe. All right, here's some basic phonological background of GABA. So here's the vowel inventory. There are 10 vowels and each vowel has an ATR pair. Um, so plus ATR and minus ATR. Um, schwa is the plus ATR counterpart of A, ah, as we'll see. There are a number of verbal suffixes in GABA, including valency changing morphology and um, nominalizing morphemes. There's also a, an optional prefixal particle. Um, and the morphemes in bold here harmonize with the root. So um, we get ATR harmony determined by the quality of vowels in the root that affects both the prefixal particle and the valency changing affixes. Um, but none of the nominalizing affixes harmonize. There are also kind of other morphemes that fall in this domain, such as object markers. Um, so roots that contain plus ATR vowels, E, A, U, O, and U, uh, um, co-occur with plus ATR vowels in valency changing affixes, and roots that contain the minus ATR vowels co-occur with, co with minus ATR vowels in the um, valency changing affixes. And within this exact same domain, we also get uh, nasal consonant harmony, um, where if the final consonant of the root is nasal, 
then sonorants in the valency changing suffixes will also surface as nasal. Um, so here is the inventory of nasal consonants in the language m, n, 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 and when one of those is the final consonant in a root, um, the valency changing suffixes that contain sonorants surface as nasal. So here's a lot of data, uh, which I'll walk you through. And the right, the first five examples here in A through E, these are all plus ATR roots. Um, the causative surfaces as schwa on these plus ATR roots, and the applicative morpheme surfaces as Li with a plus ATR high front vowel. Um, on minus ATR roots, you get the causative surfacing as a ah, and the applicative surfacing with a minus ATR high front vowel. When the final consonant of the root is nasal, um, not the you can have a nasal initial consonant and a non-nasal second consonant, and then you don't get nasal harmony. But when the final consonant of the root is nasal, um, the schwa is unaffected because there's no sonorant consonant in the in the causative. Um, but in the applicative, that initial L um, surfaces as an N. And now we're looking at one of the nominalizing suffixes. Um, lucky for us, one of the nominalizing suffixes has the same underlying form as the applicative morpheme li. Um, so the nominalizing suffix also surfaces as li, but it surfaces as li after plus ATR vowels and after minus ATR vowels and after nasal consonants. So it doesn't undergo the ATR or nasal harmony that we see with valency changing morphemes. And when you have a causative, applicative, and nominalizer all on the same morpheme, we can see the causative and applicative harmonizing, um, but the nominalizer is always Lee. Okay, um, so I'm going to analyze the domain of ATR and nasal harmony across um, these verbal affixes as due to a significant syntactic boundary between the valency changing morphemes and the nominalizing suffix. Um, all nominalizing suffixes pattern the, the way um, that Lee patterns. Um, I just only showed you the one that is homophonous with the applicative suffix. Um, so this syntax, this phase boundary in uh, GBA is um, needed to also account for other both syntactic and morphophonological processes. Um, and this seems to be the relevant domain of harmony. So when that voice phase head is merged, it's spelled out with its complement. The complement is the domain of ATR and nasal harmony. And as I mentioned, there's independent evidence for the need for this domain um, to be a phase. Um, so the thinking about the phonological constraints we need to account for this, I'm just going to use um, sort of simplified versions of harmony constraints. So I'm going to use faithfulness constraints specific to ATR and nasality. And I'm going to use constraints that just say have ATR harmony and have nasal harmony. And in the default grammar of the language, the sort of regular um, grammar of the language, the faithfulness constraints are weighted higher than the markedness constraints that say have harmony. And so this is going to get us non-harmony um, in the sort of regular grammar of the language. Um, but ATR and nasal harmony always hold within the domain of the extended projection of the verb. So I'm going to posit that there's a phonological constraint weight adjustment that triggers harmony um, that's associated with the voice head. So the vocabulary item for the voice head will look like this. Um, when you have the voice feature, it's associated with um, no underlying phonological form or prosodic subcategorization, but it's associated with um, some adjustments to the constraint weights. And these will literally add to or subtract from those default weights we saw earlier. Um, and the result is that now the uh, markedness constraints that say have harmony are weighted higher than the faithfulness constraints. So um, in the verbal domain where we have the voice head present, so here, here's a root that is both nasal and minus ATR, plus the causative suffix and the applicative suffix, um, this is within the voice domain. And so our voice vocabulary item that we just saw has adjusted the weights of the constraints and the, um, the harmony constraints have higher weights than the faithfulness constraints. Um, this results in the preferred candidate being the one that has ATR and nasal harmony. Um, this is a, what I'm showing you is a Maxent harmonic grammar tableau. 
um, the H column is the harmony score, um, and those are determined based on adding the violations of each constraint times the weight of those constraints, and the candidate with the lowest harmony score is the one that surfaces the most frequently, or in this case, categorically. Um, so now we have, if, if you can imagine sort of building up our tree from bottom up, we get to the voice phase, we spell it out. Um, this is the output of the previous tableau we just saw. And then we add a nominalizing morpheme. That nominalizing morpheme is spelled out in the next highest syntactic phase domain. And in that domain, there's no morpheme specific constraint weight adjustment. So the default constraints of these, um, the default weights of these constraints are going to apply. So we have now our um, faithful our faithfulness constraints weighted higher than our markedness constraints as per the default grammar. So nothing that was previously spelled out in the lower voice phase is going to sort of unharmonize. Um, it's going to instead be faithful to its intermediate form. But the nominalizing morpheme will also not harmonize because um, now we have the, the default constraint weights instead of the morpheme specific, the voice specific. Um, constraint weights. So we end up with harmony within the voice domain, but not outside of the voice domain. Right, this is what I just said. Within the phase containing the voice head, ATR and nasal harmony apply. In the default grammar, the faithfulness constraints outweigh harmony, um, resulting in ATR and nasal features surfacing faithfully to their underlying forms. And the result is harmony within the syntactic phase domain of the voice head, but not outside of that domain. So in this way, cophonologies by phase can account for subword morphologically conditioned phonology. In a global constraint-based model such as parallel OT, we'd expect harmony to apply across the board. Similarly, in models with indexed constraints, when a triggering affix is present, we expect a global or directional effect, um, but that's not what we see in GABA. So by applying morphological and phonological evaluation at syntactic phase boundaries, we predict um, long-distance phonological effects where locality is limited by syntactic phase boundaries. And let's see, let's look at an example where that happens across word boundaries as well. So in Korea, um, which is a Bantu language spoken in Tanzania, um, the data here, the data here comes from um, Marlowe et al, as well as personal communication with Michael Marlowe and Chacha Muita, who's a Korea speaker. Um, in Korea, different tense aspects contexts are associated with high tones on different positions in the verb stem. So just as before, the verb stems are in brackets. The high tone um, can be assigned to the first, second, third, or fourth mora of the stem, depending on the tense aspect context. And it always spreads to the penult through a regular um, high tone spreading process in the language. So when verbs have fewer moras than where we expect the high tone to be assigned, um, the following word, um, in this case, the direct object is affected. These are the examples we saw before with the inceptive, which assigns a high tone to the fourth mora. Um, in this first example, we have two moras in the verb stem. We keep counting three, four, and the high tone starts on the second mora of the object. In this third example, we only have one mora in the, in the second example, we only have one mora in the verb stem, um, and we keep counting two, three, four, and we start on the third mora of the object and spread to the penal. So we know that at least the direct object is in the domain of high tone assignment and tone spreading. Um, that's also true of following adverbs, certain types of following adverbs. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about things that do and don't fall into this domain. Um, but what we know is that at least um, following direct objects and manner adverbs have to be um, within the domain of phonological evaluation where this sort of morpheme specific high tone assignment takes place. So in cophonologies by phase, this will involve a morpheme specific cophonology, getting us the different high tone assignment patterns and phonological evaluation at phase boundaries instead of word boundaries, which allows multiple words to be um, evaluated at the same time. Here's the syntactic structure of a Korea clause. This is kind of a, a standard Bantu clause structure. And the tense aspect morphemes that trigger high tone assignment are in T. And the things that are affected um, are to the right of that slot. The relevant constraints here are a faithfulness constraint that says don't change the tone from input to output, um, a constraint um, adapted from Marlowe et al.'s paper, which says um, basically assign a high tone to the fourth mora and uh, a high tone spreading constraint that is necessary in the language um, otherwise. So in the default grammar, um, the tonal faithfulness constraint and high tone spreading are both gonna be 
highly weighted, um, the sort of morpheme specific tone assignment constraints will be will have a low weight. And this will get us tonal faithfulness, except also with high tone spreading. There's also some interaction with other constraints in the, the default grammar that I'm not talking about here. But um, in the environment of, say, the inceptive prefix, um, we have a, um, a prefix raw, which with a floating high tone, um, it's a it's specified prosodically as a prefix on a prosodic word, um, and it is associated with a constraint weight readjustment. So only in the domain of this inceptive morpheme are we going to get um, a manipulation of our default constraint weights, and we'll get um, this assigned tone to the fourth mora constraint being weighted very high, um, which will get us the high tone in the right place in the output. In the environment of other tense aspect prefixes, other tone assignment constraints outweigh this one, um, deriving the correct morpheme specific tone assignment patterns. And in the environment of no tense aspect prefix, the default weights apply and the faithful candidate will surface. Um, so morpheme specific constraint weight readjustment associated with particular tense aspect morphology uh, ensures the correct tonal overlay patterns in the correct environments and evaluation at phase boundaries accounts for why we get multiple words affected um, by this morpheme specific process. Uh, other models that apply morpheme specific phonology at word or subword levels like lexical phonology, for example, can't account for crossword morpheme specific effects like this one. Um, I'm going to skip the third case study, but the as I mentioned before, the point of this case study is to show you how multiple morpheme specific constraint weight adjustments interact within a single domain. So feel free to take a look on your own or ask me about it in the question period. Um, and instead, I'm just going to turn towards wrapping up. So prosodic and segmental morpheme specific phonological effects can apply to subword or crossword domains. They can cross words as in the Korea tone assignment example. They can be limited to a subword domain as with GBA nasal and ATR harmony. Um, they, as I didn't show you, they can also be conditioned by more than one morpheme um, as long as those morphemes are both introduced in the same syntactic domain. Um, comparing this to other models, um, Level ordering or straddle models predict that morpheme specific effects should be word bounded, um, phrasal effects should be global, and subword phonological domains are sort of only coincidentally associated with syntactic domains. But as we've seen, um, in, as in cophonologies by phase, the scope of morpheme specific effects is not sensitive to word boundaries, but phase boundaries. And this seems to be more compatible with what we see in the data. So um, we do find attested cases of crossword morpheme specific phonology. And we also predict that the domain of phonological evaluation should align with syntactic phase domains. And this is, this is testable, right? We can go um, see whether phonological, morpheme specific phonological processes across languages align with syntactic phase boundaries. Um, other morphophonological processes are also sensitive to phase boundaries and might be good candidates for evaluation in cophonologies by phase. Things like phonologically conditioned allomorph selection, syntax prosody mapping. Um, I have some current work with Taylor Miller um, looking at more at that, um, that sort of fancy P part of the vocabulary item. Um, so what, what can these morpheme specific prosodic subcategorization um, pieces do for us and um, how does that relate to syntax prosody mapping? Um, and then the phase boundedness of CBB can also account for phenomena not previously described as related to phase boundaries, such as category specific effects. So if you allow category um, categorizing heads in um, distributed morphology to be phase boundaries, then those categorizing heads like little v and little n can be associated with um, constraint weight readjustments and you would get categorized, uh, you, the result would be category specific phonology. So cophonology by phase is compatible with current assumptions in morphosyntax and phonology, such as spell out triggered at phase boundaries, late insertion of vocabulary items, and weighted constraint-based phonology. It also accounts for a wide range of uh, morphologically conditioned ph phonological phenomena, um, including crossword effects, subword effects, um, et cetera. And these phenomena are difficult to account for in other frameworks, especially, it's especially hard to find a framework that can account for all of these phenomena um, in the same model. 
So by extending our notion of vocabulary items to include morpheme specific constraint weight adjustments um, and applying phonological evaluation at phase boundaries, we can account for a wide range of phenomena, including um, those we've seen here. Morpheme specific phonology is not word bounded, but phase bounded and domains of phonological evaluation are not random or phonology specific, but they align with syntactic phase boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, as I uh, put it in the chat window, uh, please send me your name and affiliation if you have question or and and or comments. Maybe this is just a clarification question uh, uh, because it was uh, uh, it's the first time I've seen this framework. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, uh, like in your uh, in the model, like when you have the weighted constraints, uh, can uh, uh, so that's only uh, am I right to understand that uh, it's the these phase hats uh, that will have this uh, particular. Uh, Way the constraints uh, to explain to analyze basically the patterns that you see is that am I right? Like so. That's an interesting question. Yeah. So in the examples I've shown you here, actually, um, probably not in the Korea case, but in the Gavier case, it is the phase head itself that's associated with the um, the cophonology. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And oh. uh, in fact, as I sort of previewed in the. The third case study that's in the slides, um, mm -hmm. multiple morphemes within a single phase can both affect the, the constraint weights. Um, oh. So in that case, you just sort of apply that you, you add the morpheme specific constraint weight adjustments of all of the relevant um, morpheme specific constraints um, to the default weights. Um, for So for every morpheme that's introduced within that particular phase, you add all of those morpheme specific adjustments to the default weights and that's your grammar for that phase. I see, I see. So the assumption is when children acquire this language uh, and they acquire this uh, uh, elaborate uh, morphosyntactic system, basically the lexical entry for the voice hat or like not lexical entry, the entry or like the grammatical uh, feature that involves voice hat will include this R3 basically, the line in R3 is that, uh, that's the basic idea, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the acquisition side of things recently. Yeah, yeah. so no matter what model we use to get these sort of morpheme specific effects, right? The child has to learn that this, the, a particular set of phonological restrictions or phonological processes applies only when this particular morpheme is present or only in this particular morphosyntactic context. Right. Um, and um, in say an index constraint model that uh, involves learning that a particular constraint can be associated with a particular morphosyntactic feature in, co in cophonologies by phase it's, it's almost the same, except that um, instead of learning that a particular constraint is associated with this morpheme, you're saying a particular constraint weight is associated with this morpheme or a constraint weight readjustment. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Uh, so for your question. Next, yeah, sec, uh, next question is uh, from Shigeto Kawahara, KU University. Well, thanks. Uh uh, like Suhun, this is a new framework and I'm still thinking and trying to digest. I guess you've answered this partially in response to Suhun's, but the reason that you use weights instead of rankings is because you want to model that two-factor effect or... Um, yeah, so that's part of it. There's sort of two primary motivations for using weights instead of rankings. The first one is um, that when you do have interacting morpheme specific effects, it's much, um, the algorithm for getting them to work together is much more straightforward if you just add weights um, than it is to, so if, if you have just sort of a partial re-ranking associated with the voice morpheme and a different partial re-ranking associated with say the causative morpheme, then you, then getting those partial in, partial ranking, there are multiple ways you can get those partial rankings um, to, to sort of fall out. There are multiple possible um, sort of final rankings in some cases, uh, but with weights, you end up 
just straightforwardly adding them together. The, the other motivation is that in some cases we do see variation with these effects, these morphine specific effects. So for example, um, in a 2020 paper with Peter Jenks and Sharon Inkelas, one of the case studies we look at is um, Dogon um, sort of morphine specific tone assignment. And in those cases, um, it's actually another interacting effect where in a noun phrase, um, the adjective wants to assi assign some particular tone to the noun, and the possessive morpheme wants to assign some particular tone to the noun. And you end up getting, in, in certain Dogon languages, you end up getting variation where sometimes you get the noun tone winning, and sometimes you get the adjective tone winning, or the possessive or the adjective tone winning. Um, and that kind of variation can be straightforwardly accounted for with weighted constraints in a, in a way that's harder to do with ranked constraints. Thanks. A related question is both as a linguist and as a child, how do we know what's the default? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think that, um, so in most cases, there, there is sort of like a regular phonology. In most languages, there's sort of a regular phonology that applies in most contexts, right? And these morpheme specific contexts that we're talking about are a pretty limited um, domain. So um, we, um, the case study I didn't show you in Sakopoltek um, involves when you have a possessive prefix on a noun, you get lengthening, you get final lengthening. Um, and so only when you get a possessive prefix are you going to see this final lengthening grammar, right? If everywhere else in the language, you don't get final lengthening. Um, so I think the just sort of by having lots of input from not the morpheme specific, the relevant morpheme specific context, um, you sort of lo you'll learn what the default is based on frequency. Um, yeah, and and I think it would be interesting to to um, associate a learning model with cophonologies by phase and see what see what kinds of things are, if anything is if any morpheme specific constraint weights are not learnable or sort of how much in input you would need in order to sort of figure out what the default is. So it's almost like a linear mixed, mo sorry, linear mixed effect model, mm -hmm. right? You have yeah. a fixed effect and you have a random effect and you can adjust the weight. by Yeah, more. yeah. Linear Actually, there's some work by Jesse Zymet. No, that's the wrong. Mm, maybe that's right. I'm trying to think about yeah there's some work by i believe it's zymet um uh who who does try to do exactly this basically use use um linear regression models to get morphine specific um cons morphine specific learning yeah oh, conceptually it's very similar to what you're doing yeah okay great thanks Thank you. And next question is uh, by Jenny Bellick, uh, UC Santa Cruz. Hi again. Um, thanks for this interesting Hi. talk. Um, I'm wondering what's what's the role, or or is there a role for uh, interface type of prosodic categories in cophonologies by phase? Like, or do you still have the idea of like a phonological phrase, or is that completely um, subsumed by? the phases? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we still need prosody. We still need prosody. We still need to be able to refer to prosodic domains um, in order to get. So I'm thinking about two things. First, um, non-isomorphisms, when they happen, we need to be able to somehow account for those. And then also, um, here I'm looking at morpheme-specific effects that sort of span a particular domain, but there are lots of examples in the prosody literature where independent of which morphemes are present in a domain of a particular size, you get a particular process applying, um, like penultimate lengthening in many Bantu languages, for example. Um, and so I think those, it would still be useful to be able to refer to prosodic categories of different sizes in order to get those phenomena to come out right. Um, the mapping sort of when and where the mapping happens is a question that I'm playing with right now. Um, I don't have a, a firm answer for you, but um, I'm hoping that some work with um, Taylor Miller will uh, lead to some clear answers here. Basically, I think that the mapping can happen in the same step as 
Um, so like the mapping would include some sort of regular mapping of particular domain sizes, uh, syntactic domain sizes to prosodic domains, but also um, those would interact with morpheme specific prosodic subcategorizations. And I'm thinking of things like prosodic smothering, where a particular morpheme can say, like, I want to be inside of a constituent of this type, for example. Yeah. Well, I look forward to uh, reading the future work on that, because it's a question I've wondered about a lot. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any more questions? I think uh, uh, we can wrap up the session and uh, continue the discussion in a, a break, breakout session in the main room, if that's uh, okay. Let's uh, uh, let's thank uh, Hannah one more time. Uh, thank you very much uh, you, for, <laughs> for the great talk about uh, cofonology by face. Uh, I need to thank uh, some people before I close. So um, I like to thank the assistant uh, Yuki Baldoriau uh, who uh, managed all these uh, bits of running this event, and also thanking the co-host Shigeto Kawara from KU University. Uh, this event was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at KU University and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. Uh, we have uh, two talks on May 24th uh, and uh, two speakers uh, will share the research on that day. One of them is Sarah Finney from Pacific Lutheran University. In a separate series uh, on May 22nd, Benjamin Bruning from University of Delaware and Shin Fukuda from University of Hawaii will present their work. Uh, so if you have time, uh, please join us at that, uh, on these uh, talks. And also uh, related to uh, the phonology, in June, we will have uh, four speakers in a separate series uh, at the ICU link uh, presenting their talk. Uh, so it would be good to see you there as well. Thank you all who participated in today's colloquium. And uh, the discussion will continue, so please stay. And the recording will now be stopped.